Yes, for every child, rich or poor, there's a time of running through a dark place. And there's no word for a child's fear, and no ears to hear it if there is a word, and no one to understand it if they heard. It began with a death. It began with blood. Jason Blood and Abigail try to share tea, but Abigail is too shaken from the accident that she witnessed previously. It seems as if the craziness follows her wherever she goes, but it's only natural, Jason explains. She's an arcane, after all. It comes with the blood. Jason goes on to explain to Abigail that even more craziness will soon be upon her. She must make sure that Elysium Lawns becomes her highest priority. He understands that she starts work there the next day, and there's a child there, an orphan, whose parents died recently of unnatural causes. Abigail does not know how the stranger that she met this morning not only knows her first name, but her maiden name as well. She didn't ask for this strange business. Every time she finds a little bit of good, madness and evil come out, out of nowhere and smother it out. Jason tells Abigail that her self-pity does not interest him. It is only the children that he is concerned with. He instructs Abigail to save as many children as they can. For what's next, they will be even more important than her. For she knows less than they of madness, and less than him of evil. It began with blood, and it will probably end the same way too. Until then, she keeps running, through the thicket of trees, wading through the waters of the swamp. Swamp Thing leads her, hand in hand, and she can hardly keep up. She feels a stitch in her side. Her chest hurts, and her saliva tastes funny. She just wishes that there was a barrier, a fallen tree, an excuse to stop and sit down and cry and give up. But Swamp Thing continues forward, through the barrier, through the fallen tree, and out of the swamp. And she does not lose pace. They approach the heart of it all. She can feel it. She can feel it in the air. She can see it as the birds fall to the ground. She feels the dry, prickly, leaden pressure on the eardrum. She feels the fat, dark worm that writhes in someone's gut. It's fear. It thickens the night into cold, congealed gelatin. It stops the hearts of the birds. The rodents beneath her double over, petrified and immovable. Abigail used to believe that she knew fear. She didn't. All she knew were the suburbs of fear. And now, there she is, in the big city. She remembers back to that morning, when she started work. She just stood outside the front door and couldn't go in. In the end, she convinced herself that she was just being foolish and decided to just open the front door and walk right on through. Everything will be okay, she told herself. She is instantly greeted by a naked boy charging at her, preparing to attack. Abigail knew that she felt something was off, but she does not have time to think. The boy charges forward, hands cramped into claws, and screams aloud that he's an animal, an animal, animal, animal. Getting louder with every repetition, he proceeds to claw at the fear-stricken Abigail before he's pulled off by another worker. Soon, a number of workers grab the boy, calling his name out, Vince, trying to forcibly wrap him in a mat. Once they are finally successful, they briefly congratulate each other. Now, Vince can thrash about until he tires himself out. One of the workers takes this opportunity to introduce himself as Tim Carburton, and it tells Abigail that their boss, Deanna, told him about getting more help at Elysium. It's a shame that it would have to be a day like this one. Normally, one kid, maybe two, will be throwing a tantrum at a time. But it seems that all of the children are cutting loose this morning. Once Abigail gets a chance to speak to Deanna, Deanna explains that she has never seen all the children act so reckless. 
Deanna walks Abigail over to her desk, littered with scattered drawings, and explains. What is even weirder still, the drawing that the kid named Craig drew this morning. Or, if not that one, perhaps the one drawn by Helen, or Emma's, or Jean's, or the one drawn by Jose. At first, there was only one child, Paul, who was obsessed with the Monkey King. And now, all of the children share this nightmare. Paul is sitting alone when Abigail visits him. He remembers her, Abigail, A-B-I-G-A-I-L. He greets her briefly before telling her that she's gonna die soon. The Monkey King will just scare her to death. It turns into whatever someone's scared of. Paul bets that it's gonna be spiders. Girls hate spiders. Roberta, his friend, told him that the Monkey King looked like her kid brother, but he was all blue. Paul warned the adults before he showed up, and now that he has, they still don't believe him. Not everyone, Abigail tells her new friend. She believes him, but who's gonna believe her? Certainly not her husband, Matt. And why would he? She just got home from work at the Matt house. Why on earth would Abigail decide to go back, especially since it's about to get dark? Abigail snaps at Matt to take back his words. They're just kids. They don't deserve this kind of hate. Matt grabs his TV guide and begins flipping through the book before he reminds his wife that one of the children bit her this morning and another one swore at her and almost pulled her hair out. They threw up their food and they couldn't keep themselves clean. Abigail interrupts Matt once again and explains that they are just kids and they need someone tonight. But what if Matt, her husband, needs her help? Or has this whole women's power thing gone to her head? Abigail doesn't respond. She silently walks across the room to put on her jacket, fastening it tightly across her waist. Matt may have misspoken. He tries to make amends for the time being by offering the keys to the car. Abigail refuses to take her husband's help and explains that she's going to walk over to the swamp find Alec, and then she's going to Elysium Lawns. He shouldn't wait up. Abigail runs. She runs to Alec, or Swamp Thing, or whatever it is. She runs to the only person who she knew that isn't stupid or messed up. She ran to her rock. She tries to tell him about Paul, about Jason and the Monkey King, about the fear that she can smell in the air. But he already knows. He feels it too, feels it in the soil, in the wind. He'd seen it in the flight of the bird, in the eyes of the gators. He knows. She thought he knew more than her about how bad things were. He makes them run all the way there, but that must mean they're not too late, right? He wouldn't have made them run if it had been too late, would he? But she knows. She can feel it. They ran all this way, and it's already there. It's come back. After last night, Paul knew it would come back. It would come back when it got hungry. It was the fear that it wanted. It ate fear. It disgorged fear. It lived off fear, and it killed with fear. That's how it killed his mom and dad. The doctor said it was drugs or an accident, but Paul knew. His mother had bitten through her tongue. Fear. They'd been playing with that stupid Ouija board, and then they spelled something wrong. That's how the Monkey King got to this place from the other place. But it wants to stay here. It needs a master. Its touch is dry like old beetle husks. It takes Paul's hand and grins gently as it pulls him from the bed. And then after that, they take a little walk. In Roberta's room, something small and cold clambers across the counterpane. There is a sound, polythylene going in and out very fast. In the next room was Michael. When Michael was seven, 
a school friend mother had instilled in him a mortal fear of cancer. Unfortunately, she hadn't explained what cancer actually was. Michael had his own ideas. But the best of all was Jessica. Her fear was worst, was biggest, was most delicious, most intoxicating. It was Jessica's fear that sent the Monkey King crazy. Swamp Thing rips down the double door separating it and Abigail from the children's corridors, and they see it. Its voice is a slurred and mindless parody. Its features are slack and hardly formed. Whatever you're scared of, that's what it looks like. Whatever you're scared of, Abigail remembers. Its shape flows a viscous nightmare of liquid flesh. Its voice speeds and slows and changes. The children scream. The Monkey King screams. The noise is unbearable. Alec is shouting, trying to tell Abigail something. But Abigail knows that it's too late. That there's no hope. No hope in hell. So, the toys about the nursery are set. For idiot chaos to arrange at whim. He drools and ruins lives. His chin is wet. And old or young, it matters not to him. The gracious lady and a root choke beast have come to save the innocents from harm. To spare them from the monkey's dreadful feast. What noble souls they have. What faith. What charm. And see, the children's uprear brings to life their guardians. That most dedicated breed. Yet she betrays her husband. He, his wife. Though both of them are kinds of babes in need. Should innocence be mollycoddled thus? He fails to see the reason for the fuss. He is the one who comes to case the ape. He pays no heed to youth or purity. He roasts each fool that aids the beast's escape and drinks their health tonight in purgatory. Innocence? Why, to hear the tales they tell, they think they're no guilty child in hell. Feast jack and ape. Eat hearty while they can. Upon their necks, the breath of Etrigan. It began with death. It began with blood. And Matt guesses that it'll probably end the same way. He finishes his beer and looks into the mirror. The night can make a man see himself. It can make him look into his own insides. And the night can make him honest enough to accept what he finds there. All the weakness, all the selfishness, the clammy desires, and the small cruelties. Matt has been thinking, thinking since Abigail walked out that door. She needed his help, and he wasn't there. He buttons his coat and steps outside. He's going after her, going to help her, going out into the cold, the dark, the night. The night can make a man more brave, but not more sober. <laughs>